Now, he had another thing figured out in the right way. He said that if we put telescopes in the national parks, we'll have to procure the telescopes. We'll have to house the telescopes. We'll have to train somebody to run the telescopes. We'll have to pay somebody to run the telescopes. He says there's no use. He says if we leave the, the slideshows and the telescopes and the know-how with the sidewalk astronomers, we could get you from park to park for five grand a year. Never met him again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. But there are these sad stories. Now I have to tell one about the Grand Canyon. One of the rangers in Death Valley, Bill Clark was his name, he saw that what we're doing is ranger business. What we're doing is ranger service, ranger's duties. So he made us all come in and sign out papers and made us all unpaid employees of the Death Valley National Monument. <laughs> <laughs> and then he wrote to me, they've moved me to the Grand Canyon, come. <laughs> so we packed and went to the Grand Canyon. The very first day we were there, I was told that I have to talk to the man who's in charge of building buildings. Where to pull an observatory? <laughs> well, I was too tired. I said, you can't wait. To, you have to wait till tomorrow. At any rate, that's really not the way to do it. The way to do it is to have the amateurs do it and not put an observatory there. But at any rate, we went there year after year for quite a number of years, and in 80, I think it was in 80, the, the ranger asked us to keep track of how many people used the equipment. And in 16 days and nights, it was 20,000 people. 20,000 people in 16 days and nights. Now the next year, which was 81, the naturalist sent me a letter, which he had Xeroxed, a letter sent to him, and I quote the first line, we don't need to be exposed to such controversial views in the national parks. And in that letter, he put all his pet peeves against the scientists into my mouth, things which I never say, which were things which aren't remotely true. Anyway, he asked us not to return sent me that letter and asked us not to return. I stayed away for 14 years. This year, last year I went back as a guest of someone else. But I answered his letter. I said, we don't say those things. And you also don't say that the rocks at the bottom of this canyon started on October 23rd, 4004 BC. You don't talk like that, why should we? Well, anyway, we should do these things in the national parks if there's any way we can do it, because that's where the American public collides with the sky. Now, I had a beautiful letter from France years ago that we're following your expo exploits in the magazines, but we don't just follow, we try to do likewise. They have a Coulter 17 and a half inch, which they use for the public. But he says, you set your telescopes there in places that make us dream here. <laughs> Anyway, people in Belgium ask, can we use the term sidewalk astronomers? Of course you can. And people in the Philippines, can we use the term sidewalk astronomers? They have a logo with the sidewalk. <laughs> the sidewalk and the telescope on the sidewalk. Anyway, now you can ask me some questions. That was all in answer to your question. <laughs> some questions are little with big answers. <laughs> wants to ask. You can ask anything you like. Yes. What, what do you find is, uh, I can't even hear you, let alone the rest of them. What do you find is most, most useful in getting the children interested? Telescopes. <laughs> uh. What was that? That's the long and the short of it? <laughs> yes, telescopes. Because, you see, most people well, let me put it this way. There's a reason why we sidewalk astronomers run around with telescopes like this. Almost everything you see on the surface of this planet, your interpretation of it is colored by your genetic programming. It tells you how to inter interpret beaches, oceans, palm trees, grasses, suns, moons, everything, people, dogs, lions, 
everything. You've got a genetic programming that tells you how to interpret it. And when you look through the telescope, they shut up. <laughs> Your genetic programming has nothing to say about the rings of Saturn or what the moon looks like through a telescope. Some lady at, at, uh, at uh, Griffith Park uh, a few years ago uh, said to me, we had Venus in the evening sky, a nice crescent Venus. She said, Venus looks like the moon, and the moon looks like the Earth, as if it was all my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, how much, how, how much uh, solar observing do you do with, with Dodsonian telescopes in the daytime? We do a great deal, and we always look at the sun in the daytime. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. You, you left the door open. We make what we call fail-safe sun telescopes. We have a, suppose the tube is like this, we have a front plate at 45 degrees. Okay. It throws 95% of the light away. It's a transparent mirror, reflective 95%, transmissive 5%. 5 5% 5 of the light comes in. The objective is unsilvered. 96% goes on through. 4% comes back. So we're down to one part in 500. Hits the front plate, reflected up through a welder's glass. That eats 99%. Let's through only the green. Takes out all the ultraviolet, all the infrared, lets only about maybe five one thousandths of the incoming, no, let me see, uh, about ten millionths of the incoming beam get into your eye, and that only in the green. And these things are fail safe because if the front plate is broken, the observer would be looking at the ground through a welder's glass that's known to be safe. <laughs> the only way you can burn your eye with a sidewalk astronomer's sun telescope is set fire to the telescope and hold your eye over it. <laughs> First, you have to get permission. <laughs> Somebody else back there, yeah. Yeah, do you remember the view that hooked to you in the first place? The, the, the view? Yeah, do you remember the view that, that just hooked you into This started on me? Yes, I do. Uh, first of all, I was in the monstery, you see, we call it a monstery. Uh, and uh, uh, we wanted, and I, I was interested in galaxies. And uh, uh, we, uh, we had a friend who had jaundice, and he had a glass disc on his table. I remember when we took care of him, he had his glass disc on his table. So we called him up and asked, how would you like to have that ground into a telescope mirror? Oh, he'd love it. Well, it turned out to be 12 inches in diameter and one inch thick. I had no idea. I thought it was much smaller. So that was the first one. We, we started like that. And uh, when I first looked at the moon through one of those old 12 inches, the third quarter moon, I thought, I, it looks as though you're coming in for a landing. I had no idea it looked like that. No idea at all. And I thought, my God, that's a, inside of me a thought. Everybody's got to see this. That's what happened to me. And I don't know what's happened to you. <laughs> yeah. I talked to you about 10 years ago on cosmology. Uh, and uh, why don't you bring us up to speed on the uh, undivided... Uh, Oh, you do, do you? Well, I'm, I'm much more interested in those things than I am in telescopes. I talk about telescopes under duress. And for the most part, the amateurs now know, don't make me talk about telescopes. <laughs> so I'd be happy to talk about some of those things. And you know, I have a shirt on here. Can you read this? <laughs> the, thing of the, the Big Bang is the thing of the past. But nobody thinks it's the thing of the present. But you see, the Big Bang, I don't need this, the Big Bang people have this notion, you see, that about maybe 15 billion years ago, nothing made everything out of nothing. <laughs> I don't think it will wash. I was talking to some little kids in Oregon uh, about a summer ago, uh, the summer before last summer, and I mentioned that the Big Bang people 
wanted us to believe that nothing made everything out of nothing. And one of those kids says, you can't make anything out of nothing. <laughs>